I hope you uh, didn't need anything too heavy, because there's plenty of material we still need to cover. Uh, I've passed among you during the break, and I saw a couple of technical issues, just a couple of notes. A, if Dojo doesn't work for you because of any virtualization issues, don't worry. You can still use, um, you can still use either the local instance of WebGoat or the local uh, instance we have here in the Wi-Fi lab of WebGoat. Both will work for most of the exercises that we have in this training, okay? Uh, uh, second of all, uh, many of the mistakes were related to people not activating their proxy or their proxy were actually, was actually down. So they didn't get any response from the website because either they closed Zap for some reason or because, uh, I don't know, just they forgot to change the icon of, of the Foxy proxy and actually pick Zap in there, okay? So a couple of guidelines to make sure that you're on the right track and your proxy is properly configured. If you have configured your proxy properly and you uh, kind of like made sure that your browser work with it, the Foxy proxy icon outside of Jojo in your own PC should be blue and inside of Dojo, okay, the icon of MJ at the uh, upper left corner here, or whatever the, uh, the plugin is called, should be red, okay? That's how you know that it's configured to a proxy. I don't know if it's the right proxy, but it's configured to a proxy. If uh, the upper left corner is grayed out in Dojo or Foxy proxy isn't blue in your own uh, PC, it's not configured to use a proxy so it won't work, okay? Second, make sure that your proxy is running. And third, make sure it's, ru it's running on the same port that you configured in either Pro Foxy proxy or the plugin in uh, Web Security Dojo. Now, uh, the plugin Web Security Dojo already uses a predefined port 0883. There's no point changing the port in Zap within Dojo because it's working, it's already pre-configured. We're only changing the configuration in Zap when we install it ourselves in our own PC to avoid conflicts. They already thought about the conflict part in Dojo and fix it for us, okay? Now, um, we have about three or four or five attacks, whatever we managed to cover in the time frame that we have, to discuss today. But before we continue, I want to complete the setup of Zap in your own PCs, okay? Eventually, most of the participants in the course already got the basics, which is get the Foxy proxy slash Firefox slash Zap setup working together. You, most of you, or most of you, uh, most of the participants that I work with, I've seen that they're able to, uh, they were able to uh, cause the interception part and uh, to work properly. They were able to view HTTP communication and to figure out which relevant parts in the protocol are or aren't interesting. I'm not saying you uncovered okay, vulnerabilities, not yet, but you managed to figure out the protocol. Now we should be able to intercept requests and make sure the proxy is working in any event, okay? So a couple of nice features in Zap that I really recommend that you try now. Now it doesn't matter if you try it in front of a Web Security Dojo or Hackazon or WebGoat or the internet or your own web website. It doesn't really matter. Just experience using the features in Zap in front of any website, okay? So it doesn't matter what the target is, it's only, it only matters that you do what I'm doing right now, okay? So let's talk about how do we actually modify values to Zap. So up until now, we modified values either in the URL or in the GUI level. When you hacked into Web Security Dojo using O1 equals one, you used an attack payload to the GUI, okay? You use the attack payload on the actual text box. However, you could also, if the parameter would have been delivered in the URL, you could have also done it through the URL, but it was all, it was all manual. You didn't really need Zap for any reason except viewing the URLs, okay? Or viewing the history of requests. However, we can use Zap to actually intercept requests and modify them. There's a very nice button here. 
the record button or the whatever it's called here. See this button? That one, the, the breakpoint button, the intercept slash breakpoint button. In order to intercept requests which are coming right now, we need to click it. Okay, so let's say I'm going to uh, send a new request here in Web Security Dojo. I'll use Dojo for, uh, in, uh, just to verify I won't have any garbage communication. I want to intercept the next request that I'm sending to Dojo. I'll click the intercept button and then I'll access any URL here in the application, okay? Let's see if it actually worked or uh, let's see if I'm doing anything wrong. Maybe I'm not getting something right here. This is what I want. Maybe I can find it on the own website. Here I go using Zap and eventually, ah, okay. And eventually when I did it work, it's not working for me. Okay, let's try it here. Okay, so let's see. What you saw right now is me doing something in my browser window, Zap intercepted the request. Let's see. Okay, so the breakpoint element in, a, in Zap, let's just disable it for a second and access some other URL. Let's say I'll access the login URL. will cause the browser uh, to kind of hover and uh, cause the proxy to kind of hover and intercept the request that you're currently accessing, okay? Let's go to the last page in the history. Let's see if I'm doing it right this time. AAA, -A -A, 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 A, sign in. You see what happened? Zapped, popped up to the uh, front of the screen, and you see the request to the login page of WebGoat being intercepted with the username and password that I have entered, okay? So the response was not sent to the server. There's various voice issues here. The response was not sent to the server. It was sent to the proxy and the proxy, instead of delivering it to the website, intercepted it, and now I'm able to change it and release it, okay? Not the why it didn't work with Dojo, I'll figure it out later, but uh, if I'll send, I don't know, whatever, whichever payload, attack payload I want to send, I'll simply modify the values here and send the request with a play, okay? Got it? Okay, so there's two, uh, two things I can do with intercept. I can either release and immediately intercept the next request response sequence or simply release everything until the next breakpoint that I define. So let's say I'm currently uh, intercepting the following request and I'm sending, I don't know, SSS, SSS. Intercepting it and changing whatever, I'll, I should be able to release a single request and get the response. You see now, I intercepted the response. Zap didn't only intercept the request being sent from the browser to the server, it intercepted the response being returned from the server to the browser. So I should be able to modify both the outgoing information, the request and its parameter, and the returning information. The response, HTML, whatever I want to modify in the content that the browser sees. So if there's hidden flags, I can unhide them. If there's anything I want to change in the presentation layer, I can do it, okay? In this case, it was, a, it was a redirect instruction that will cause the browser to redirect to another page, okay? So I intercepted Zap automatically because I'm releasing 
request by request with this button, we only intercept, intercept release one request, intercept one response, and so on and so on. If the browser keeps sending requests, they'll keep being intercepted. Okay? I want you to try that right now in front of any website, not from Dojo, in, with your local Zap instance. Okay? Any website, doesn't really matter. Just intercept or click the intercept button right here, the breakpoint button. Okay? Access any uh, website that you want, intercept a single request, see the request being, inter being intercepted, and then release it. Okay? You can either release one request so you can intercept the response in all the consecutive requests and release or release all of them or simply disable the interception entirely, whatever you prefer, okay? Give it a shot. In the meantime, I want to show you while you're trying it, another method to modify communication uh, of previous requests, okay? Interception lets us modify requests we're seeing right now, or communication that we're testing right now. But sometimes we want to attack just by taking a look at the tree and seeing interesting parameters. It's actually one of the key methods to identify vulnerabilities. Sometimes it's more than enough just to look at the names of the parameters in the tree. Remember we discussed parameter tampering? We talked about the parameter having significant the significance. So if we'll see, for example, the price parameter here, we didn't have to see anything in the page. We could have seen that in ZAPS3. That's it. Just going over the parameter names presented in ZAP3. Now, you know, that there's brackets in the, the signifying that the values aren't your reds, they're actually parameters in ZAP3, but you can see that there's a screen and menu parameters in the get URL. And there's price, quantity, and submit uh, parameters in the post body. Okay, you can see all the parameters of the uh, of the uh, request of previous requests and current requests in Zap's tree view. Okay, now we, now we don't want to reconstruct or reproduce the scenario. We want to attack that entry point right now. We don't want to go to the browser to the Google to the entire process. We can do that with the resend feature. Okay. It's called repeater in Burp, those of you who are Burp fans. In Zap, it's called a resend. Just right click either on the history, the request you want in the history, or simply on the tree and click resend. Okay? It will open up another pop up and allow you to modify whatever you want in the original request and resend it. Okay? So if I want to buy something, I don't know, to like zero or modify my card, that's the place to do it. So I can either do it using interception, like I'm doing a login right now, I want to hack the login phase, I'll intercept the request, modify whatever I want, and send the request to the server, or I can, um, I can do that directly from the resend features just by, uh, you know, right clicking on the request that I want to abuse, modify, etc. Right click, resend, modify what I want, and just press send, okay? Much, much more convenient and uh, typically used, uh, you know, we, we use it more than use the, the actual interception features in actual attack and pain, at least I do, okay? Um, so that's a ZAP interception feature. There's other methods to use ZAPs, obviously, but we wanted to discuss another relatively complex scenario in ZAP, which is SSL interception, okay? I told you that I, uh, I'll postpone it to the end of the day, but you know what? I've decided otherwise because you guys, I don't know, you're, you're tired right now. And uh, if you're going to sleep, uh, at least I'll give you a good subject to sleep. However, if you won't listen in the next half an hour and do it properly, you probably won't be able to use anything I'm teaching today at home because it won't work. Kind of nice. These days, most of the websites will be using, testing, whatever, they'll be in SSL. And since they'll be in SSL, if you want to know how to use the interception proxy with SSL, simply none of the stuff we learn will work. Figuring out how to make your tool work properly is key, okay? So I really recommend, although it's a tedious process, and it is tedious, that you listen how to do it. And even write it down, because once you get home, you know, you'll forget it. It won't work, you'll replace the computer. It's one of the things you should write down. 
Although there are slides for it and you'll get them, you won't understand alone for slides and you'll be too lazy without figuring out now. Okay, so listen carefully. <coughs> to attack or modify communication in SSL websites, Zap actually uh, performs something called a many in the middle attack against a browser. What Zap does, the browser attempts to initiate a secure SSL communication channel with the remote website, let's say Google or your bank or, your bank or whatever. Now, the process of initiating an SSL communication channel includes switching certificates, specifically from the server to the client. The server will respond to the client to the certificate, the client will verify the authenticity of the certificate, and then a secured communication, sh communication channel will be performed somehow. Black box, doesn't matter the details. However, somebody can intervene in the middle. Zap can intervene in the middle between the browser and the server and replace the certificate the server returns with his own certificate. So, de facto, the browser will open a secure communication channel in front of Zap. He will think that Zap is the server and open a secure communication channel, and Zap will do the same in front of the server. So, instead of the browser opening a secure communication channel in front of the server, he will open it in front of Zap, and Zap will open another one in front of the server. We will have two secure communication channels. However, the designers of SSL, one second. The designers of SSL created SSLs just for that eventuality. They tried to prevent malicious entities from intercepting communication and deciphering it in the network without your acknowledgement, okay? So if you do just that with Zap without any pre-configuration, you'll get warnings and exceptions. And you know, stuff won't work in your browser. It will tell you point blank that something is wrong. And he's right, okay? To make the browser shut up, because we're taking the attacker holes here, right? We're, we're the hackers here in this We're going to uh, import that certificate to the holy grail of the browser, to the trusted root certification authority store. We're going to make sure that the browser completely trusts that certification authority and anything that says for that matter. So we won't get any exceptions when we put Zap and in the man in the middle role, okay? Bottom line, we need to export Zap certificate and import it into the browser that we use with Zap in order for the browser to ignore the fact that Zap will serve as a man in the middle, to trust it completely, okay? That's the only way to work efficiently and consistently with SSL websites. To do that with Zap, do it right now with me, on your PC, not on Dojo, it's already pre-configured there, okay? Go in Zap to Tools. Tools and Options, okay? Tools Options in Zap on your own PC. There's a section called Dynamic SSL Certificate. Somewhere in, no, close to the beginning somehow. Dynamic SSL Certificates, okay? Not need to change anything, you just need to save the certificate that Zap has. You can, you can also replace the certificate if you don't like it for whatever reason. You, can, you generally need to save it so we can export it to a browser, okay? Store it in you know, your download directory or some other directory that you can access, desktop, whatever, doesn't really matter. After you save it on your desktop, it's OWASP, blah, blah, CA, what, something, Go to your Firefox browser, it can also be performed, it should be performed for other browsers if you use them with Zap. Go to the options feature here, okay? I'll wait with you to so, uh, catch up. Go to the options feature. Let's hope I find it, this one. Keep hiding it in different Firefox versions, it's very hard to keep track. Privacy and security. Good. 
If you go to the uh, tools options here, okay, the toolbar, the toolbar and the options button, go to privacy and security and scroll down, you'll eventually get to a certificates, a certificate section at the bottom of the page, almost, almost the bottom if you scroll it down, okay? If you go to certificates and select view certificates, okay, view certificates, I'll uh, just shut it down to let you see, get to that window, to the view certificates window, privacy and security, view certificates, you can go to the authorities section and press import, okay? And then select the certificate, the ZAP certificate, just pick all files, okay? Let's see. You should see the ZAP certificate that you saved on your desktop, or ZAP root CA dot C, okay? Choose that and if you see it for the first time, you may see optional checkboxes that you need to mark. Mark every optional checkbox you see in the import process and press OK to make sure that the certificate is associated with the highest level permission. Okay? I'll do that again, just for those of you that didn't catch up. We go into the toolbar in Firefox and select options. We go to privacy. We scroll it down to the end. We'll see certificates. Okay? You pick. The view, you click the view certificates button, go to authorities, and import the certificate that you stored on the desktop. That's, it, that's the name, OSP ZAP root CA, okay? OSP ZAP root certification authority. Okay, pick it, select any optional fields that you have, import it, restart, Firefox, just in case, okay? We start Firefox just in case. Configure it to use ZAP and access an SSL website, okay? I don't know, let's pick a website which is SSL and isn't completely fanatic, I don't know. How about Google, okay? Let's try Google. <coughs> See, Google uses HTTPS. See here, Google uses HTTPS, and even though it's using HTTPS, my proxy intercepts the communication. It's still working with ZAP. See here, Google, Google CRL, Google.com, whatever, they're all appearing in my uh, in my proxy tree view. Okay? Now, uh, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to make sure it's working. Roy, are you here? Roy? Anyone having problems configuring the SSL certificates? Okay. Um, Roy will come to you in a second. If anyone, you didn't understand the explanation, you want me to explain again or something isn't working? How to import it? Yeah. Okay, so guys, do you need assistance? No problem. Well, we'll, we'll, be there, we'll be there in a second, okay? So um, we'll go over the process again, once again, start to finish to make sure, just to make sure that the guys that didn't understand it have the chance to fix it on their own and then we'll pass along you and try to fix it for you. A, phase A, we need to export ZAP certificate. We export ZAP certificate using tools, options, dynamic SSL certificates. That's how we do it. We save it on the desktop and now we have something to import. Tools, options in ZAP, save, in dynamic SSL certificate, save it on the desktop. Then we go to Firefox, go to the toolbar, we go to options, we go to uh, privacy and security, we scroll it down till the end, okay? We'll see the uh, certificate titles, okay? The certificates title, we'll, uh, we'll pick the view certificates button and then we'll import the OSP 
a ZAP would see a certificate that we stored earlier, okay? In my case, the certificate was already imported in the past, so it doesn't let me complete, uh, complete the, the import visual as, as it should, but you know, that's, the, that's more than good enough for our purposes. Now, um, Since the Dojo doesn't have a certificate inside. Um, okay, it doesn't matter because you don't need to use Dojo for actual hacking outside of, outside of Dojo. It's not really designed for that. Dojo is more for training. You should use it to test internally. And none of the internal websites in Dojo, Dojo uses SEL. So it's okay. The, the setup should really be performed more on uh, your own PC, on Zap. Because you know, if, if you use it back home or you know, in your own uh, work environment, you won't be using Dojo. You won't actually raise a whole virtual machine just to run Zap. It doesn't make sense. If you need other tools, there's, you know, there's Kali Linux or other dedicated testing environments. You won't use Dojo for it. So my, my advice, configure it on your own PC, in Zap in your own PC. Let Dojo serve as a training ground. If you want a professional hacking uh, test bed or you don't want a professional toolkit for uh, security tools, it's Kali Linux. So, um, so far, we only covered a single attack, okay? We only co covered a parameter tampering. We covered various methods to manipulate client originating parameters with business significance in order to abuse some business logic feature, okay? flags, identities, resource identifiers. I'm going to go to the solution that you should have gotten to in the various sections of the training, okay? In the exercise. And then I'm going to go, to go on and cover additional aspects. You'll notice that I'm ignoring the last parameter tampering aspect, file names. This is because we're going to discuss it under, under the past traversal attack we're going to cover later on today, okay? So don't worry, we'll cover that. It's very interesting. It's all right, we'll get to that. So the solution, I'm going to go to a, a web security dojo first and then to web go, okay? In dojo, if you would have uh, accessed the application with a low privileged user, a Smith Andy, I won't even do it with Zap because you don't really need to. You can use the URL. There are various things you can see, but the most obvious one most obvious one, is the view account feature. Now, if you notice, the account has a number, like every bank slash financial account has. It has a number, your pension fund, you know, you have your number in the, in the pension fund, your bank account number, you have a number. You have a resource identifier that you can access. Now, by clicking on the link to the account, you'll get the account information, but you'll also see a param parameter signifying to the server side which, uh, which value you're trying to access, okay? See, I think I have something intercepting my requests, maybe. Or it's just slow, it's just slow, okay? Now it's hard to see, so I'll magnify it, or try to magnify it somehow. Let's see if I manage to do that. Good. That's the URL that uh, the browser accessed when I accessed an account. And you'll notice that there's an account identifier here in the URL. See that? Now, I'm currently the owner of account 201 and account 202. I saw that when I accessed my menu. So that I'm the owner because I'm allowed to view account 201 and 202. How about 203? Who's the owner? Probably on this account, How about 204, okay? Now you could have tried a couple of variations. Eventually, the next closest account would have been 301, okay? Let's just see. That's better. Okay, so my account 201 has $100 in it, account 202, you know, has literally zero, uh, zero in it. If I access account or the link provided information on account 301, I'll just change the number in the URL 
from 290, 301 or, 300, or 401 or whatever, you'll see an account which isn't mine. It has different sums, different transactions, okay? Typical parameter tampering, you won't believe how those attacks work, okay? Some of the people in the audience which I work with on a regular basis, they already know. It is everywhere. It's very hard to prevent this attack because you literally have to perform an inspection on permission everywhere. You have to validate the permission of the accessing entity in any URL in the application that accesses a resource. Now, it's very easy if there's 10 URLs in your application. How about 300 URLs? If there are 300 REST services in your application and there's a bunch of parameters, all of them dealing with resources, it's very hard not to forget one or two or ten, okay? So a, an attacker with either luck or a, a consistent attacker, let's say that way, uh, will probably identify those vulnerabilities if he's persistent, okay? Now, that was the vulnerability I wanted you to cover in, uh, in uh, Insecure Web App. There's other vulnerabilities, but that was the good example I wanted you to see, okay? Now, in uh, WebGoat, there was a shopping cart uh, fraud very close to the demonstration we saw. We already talked about it and saw the parameter. I'll show it again anyway. I'll access Web Security Dojo just for a sec. No, Dojo. I'll access uh, WebGoat, I'm sorry. Just for a second. I'll access the local instance with your permission. In the parameter tampering section, you have the uh, exploit hidden fields. And you have the shocking card. Now, we could have messed with the quantity, but you can mess with it with the GUI. You don't really need that proxy to mess with something which is in the GUI level, unless they validate things in the client side. And then you can bypass the input validation using ZAP, okay? And you can use ZAP to modify the relevant sums. We'll do that by intercepting the request, okay? Let's just inter intercept the next request. Let's do an update card, okay? Zap interception feature should have intercepted the request. Let's, lay, let's say we buy 100 products at ANO. One USD each, okay? Fair trade, I say, okay? At least for one of the participants here. Now, if I go to the total cost in the shopping cart, I'm just buying 100 units in $100, okay? That's another shopping cart fraud you can uh, do with parameter tampering. Now, I think we've had enough about parameter tampering. Anyone has basic questions regarding the uh, methodology of attacking, abusing, identifying parameter tampering or potential to parameter tampering? No point being ashamed right now. There's very few... Uh, uh, sections in the course uh, dedicated for questions. There's like, I don't know, 150 participants. Raise your hand. Anything? Yes. How do you protect the conditions identifier? You, you perform an ownership validation or association validation. The server side code, by the way, don't worry, we'll get to secure development aspects in the end of the course. I am intentionally postponing it, okay? In the server side, in the, in the server side, not the client side, the server side, the developer should validate that the resource identifier is owned by the user attempting to, to access it, okay? It requires typically either another query to the database or an index ownership table. And you load all the resources of the user to a table in the, you know, in the session, run whatever, and then you, uh, you know, make any cross and make sure that the identifier is owned through uh, comparisons to that table. Okay? Bottom line, you just inspect it, man. You can do it in numerous ways. Sure. Another question? So, fantastic way to test for parameter tempering, and I encourage you to use it today, tonight, with e-commerce websites. Not to actually hack them, that's illegal, remember? Just to look at the parameters, to figure out how the world works. Go to Zap, uh, not to OSP Zap, go to Zap comparison websites, like we discussed earlier access various e-commerce stores and see the type of parameters that are being sent from the client. You will be amazed. Go to a couple, don't 
stick with one and say, hey, it's a kill, so the e-commerce stores are skill. Just surf around. You don't need anything more besides just looking at Zap's tree view. That's enough. The names of the parameter will signify the reason, their, you know, their purpose, discount, prices, whatever. Now, the second attack I want to discuss, it's not exactly a relative of parameter tampering, it's just as old as it, as it is, is called forced browsing, okay? Um, the slide is on old backup on reference files, but I'll discuss forced browsing there, I'll probably skip the slides somewhere along, along the way. So, yes? Yes, of course. The Zap fuzz testing feature, the automation feature, which is fantastic, by the way. Uh, I actually use it more than I use Burps feature. Uh, in that specific feature, I like the dictionaries, okay? There, there's a various optional dictionaries you can do Zap. We'll get to that, but we will get to that once we discuss the automated features in Zap. The reason I'm teaching Zap and not Burp free edition, which is probably has better memory management, is because Zap has built-in scanning and fuzzing features in the free version. There's only a free version, it's OSP, okay? So uh, those features are very useful to pen testers trying to enumerate. So if you do that in Burp free edition, you'll be limited to the quantity or uh, speed of the test. If you do that in Zap, you know, there's no commercial restrictions. You can simply use the enumeration feature. So you, as an answer to your question, yes. To show it to you, just if you, know, if you ask, if I wanted to do enumeration with Zap for a specific uh, identifier, I'll go in Zap, I'm going to show it in Dojo specifically because I need uh, the request to be visible. Let's see, I'm not sure I'm working with Zap here. No? Yes, Zap is disabled. I'm going to uh, route the communication to Zap. Let's say I want to do enumeration for some sort of an identifier. I don't want to guess it all on my own. I'll go to Zap and I'll right click on the relevant request I want to fuzz. Okay, that's the, the professional term we'll use here. Fuzz testing, okay. That's the request. It's very hard to see, okay? So I'll right click and press <laughs> fuzz. It will open up the fuzzing window in Zap, and I can pick either numbers, characters, uh, whatever I want. It's very slow here for some reason. No, I'll show it in, a, in, a, in another request. It will work the same in Dojo and in Zap, in Zap outside of Dojo. You right click on a certain request that you want to fuzz, you pick fuzz on that request, and you'll get to that window, okay? Now, in this window, we'll have to uh, figure out what do you want to fuzz, which element of the request. So let's say I want to fuzz the URL or a specific parameter or something else, I need to add a fuzz point to it, okay? Right, please fuzz, pick the element you want in the URL, you can pick a couple of elements, and then Zap will replace the three characters I selected with whichever list of values I add to it, okay? So I can add a number of values. I can add strings. So if you want something numeric, open up an Excel, write numbers one, two, three, and drag and drop it, you know, to, to 1,000 and copy the entire Excel sheet and paste it here. And then to replace it from, you know, whichever numbers you listed. Just, you know, just to, to show you what I'm doing, I'll just open up an Excel sheet. There's probably an easier work method, you know, but I'm kind of old school here. Uh, I don't know, it's old school or, you know, being lazy to figure out the actual convenient method in Zap. I'll just write one, two, three. Drag the bit to whichever number I want. I don't know, 157 copy the entire list of uh, values that I uh, anyway, copy the entire list of values that I have and paste it into this uh, 
box in Zap, the appropriate box in Zap. And that's it. To replace uh, the values with the values that I placed. Okay? That's pretty much it. It will take every value that I uh, separated by CRLF that I have placed here and replace the, end, the value in, uh, in the request with it and gather up all the responses. Okay? And let you see the various element of each response. It will tell you, hey, this response have, uh, I don't know, 50 characters in the response. This response has an error code of 500. And through the differentiation of the responses, you'll be able to figure out which resources existed and which did not exist. Or you don't have permission to access them. Okay? Does that answer the question? Who asked it, by the way? Oh, okay, so I got confused. Too many participants. So anyway, that's the fast uh, fuzzing feature. We also have dictionaries, by the way. We'll get to that once we discuss all the obsolete files and stuff like that, but that's enough for now. Okay, so I started discussing force browsing, okay? Force browsing is a very different attack. It's an attack in which instead of directly accessing to a resource identifier which isn't my own, I'm accessing a, a, a web page that I'm not supposed to access. In the previous days, you know, 2002, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, it was very common that security would have been enforced through GUI countermeasures, meaning if you would have been a simple user, the GUI, the graphical interface, the web pages presented to you in the menus in the website you were accessing only listed the URLs that you're supposed to see. But there wasn't any enforcement if you would have directly accessed, accessed a, a, a URL in another, in another location that you weren't supposed to access. Directly accessing admin pages, for example. So a nice a story from a customer that is actually sitting here in the audience. Uh, an application I tested it uh, for him in a couple of years, a couple of years ago, uh, probably 2009, something like that. They had a fantastic application. You know, it was beautifully designed. It was working pretty well. No SQL injection or stuff like that. Uh, I know it was supposed to be hard to hack, and they had a help feature in the application. Now the help feature actually listed. It was you know it was kind of like a shelf product, anyone could have bought it. It's not a website in the internet, it's more like a product that you send to customers and you know, resell to customers. And the website, eventually the product was like a locally hosted website inside the organization. And the help page actually described how each user uses every feature, every possible feature in the application, okay? Now it included, the help page, it included screen captures. And the beautiful thing about it, since it explained the role of users and administrators, the screen captures in the help page actually included the URLs, okay? So just by viewing the help pages, you could have seen the URLs of all the admin pages. So it was a Java application because that was the, the, that's the typical language the organization used. And just by writing, I think it was something like a slash admin slash addusers.jsp, something like that, without any authentication, nothing, without being authorized to the system, you could simply just directly access the administrator pages, add an administrator user, and then that's it, you're in. They didn't forget to verify the authentication slash authorization in all the pages. They only forgot to do it in a few, but that's enough, okay? Now, forced browsing is an attack in which the attacker directly accesses an entry point in the server, a web page, a web service, a REST method, it doesn't really matter. Instead of going through the normal flow of authenticating to the system and only then going through if he has permission, he either guesses the name of internal secret unauthorized high privileged pages or identifies them through other means. We'll get to those means later on, okay? So, Method. The attacker attempts to either bypass the authentication entirely, he doesn't have an account for the system, or the, att the attacker is a low privileged user and is attempting to access an admin or high privileged user resources, meaning pages, web services, etc. The method to do so is simply to guess the name and parameters required to access a high privileged slash authenticated entry point. Okay? 
As an example, let's take Web Security Dojo, okay? To demonstrate it. I'll intentionally close up in Dojo for now. You don't need it right now. Within Dojo, if you would have gotten no, to the admin interface in Dojo, which is typically, you know, anytime you write O1 equals 1, you're typically the admin. So let's say I'll intentionally access the admin pages here. Within the admin account, the, within the admin account, there's the whole admin section here. You see that? There's a variety of pages that are only supposed to be available to an administrative user. When you logged out, logged in with the user uh, Asmit Andy, we didn't even get to those links. We weren't able to identify them, okay? They weren't in our menu. So those, you know, features, they have an address in the website. In this case, those, those are web pages. Uh, so I'll just copy them to prove my point. I'll copy both of them. And I log out of the application, out of the application. Now, if an attacker would have been able to guess the name of those pages for whatever reason, okay, and access them directly, there's two options. A, it wouldn't work because it's not authenticated, or B, it would work regardless of authentication methods, okay? In this case, you notice that I logged out, and even though I logged out, I, just by writing the right URL address and directly accessing it, I already got in. I not, only, not only did I got in, I'm able to activate the feature that only an administrator is supposed to activate. I can now enable, disable account, delete accounts, and whatever. Now, the funny thing is, uh, that administrative pages are much more prone to those exposures, and I'll explain why. User-specific pages usually query something in order to present custom user content to the user. Usually use a user identifier found in the session or something similar to filter the information presented to the user. Accessing those pages without any authentication means that there will be an exception because there won't be any thing to filter uh, in the queries. Typically, uh, normal authentication bypass, it's not it won't necessarily work. In many pages, in user-specific pages, it simply will cause exceptions and other elements will intervene with the attack. Since the administrator doesn't have any content filtering, there's no permissions being enforced on the administrator, he's able to access everything there's very little chance that there will be an exception, exception because something will be missing. Lack of authentication enforcement won't be mitigated by any other controls, okay? Um, so, um, in general, force browsing can be used to do a couple of things, okay? Force browsing can be used a, to bypass the authentication entirely and access internal entry points, either user-specific, rarer, or administrative, okay? And force browsing can also be used to elevate the privileges of a user. There's two different types of checks. The developer may check, hey, is the user, is, is the user already authenticated? And that's one check. And the uh, developer can also check, is the user authorized to access this page, okay? Now, the developer may forget to do either one of those checks, but in, uh, for our purposes, bypassing or elevating permissions may be possible even if the developer is verifying whether the user is authenticated. So let's say I'm a simple user in some bank, 
and I'm trying to access the, administrative, uh, the administrator pages in the website, okay? I may be able to access the web page because the developer isn't checking for permissions, but an unauthenticated attacker may not be able to because there's an authentication validation, which is general. I won't know until I test both options, both as an unauthenticated user and as a low privileged authenticated user, okay? So to perform this attack, all I need to do is to figure out how to identify entry points in the application and access them directly. Let's talk about the how, okay? By the way, uh, anyone have any questions so far? Regarding false browsing, parameter tampering, anything? Okay, I'm guessing no. So, okay, so to identify entry points, um, in general, I can use a couple of features in Zap. A, I can use the fast testing feature with a dictionary of files. That's one option, okay? I just uh, do the fast testing on another request, which is more suited to it. Let's say, um, pick a website I can hack legally. Okay, so I access my own website just for the purposes of this demo. I have the feeling that I won't be suing myself. And I'll do some fast testing on it. Now, by accessing the website to Zap, it was added to Zap list of uh, websites. I can just pick any URL I want in the website. Just disable the proxy, too much garbage here. Just pick any URL that I want to uh, fast test on. So by picking the fast testing feature and selecting the entire URL, I'll be able to replace it with different page or directory names. That's just one way to do it. To do it, there's other methods I'll be showing them in a second. Now, by marking the URL element, okay, the page name, the entry point name element, and clicking add. I should be able to pick a file fuzzer, that's how it's called, a file fuzzer, from a list of pre-configured fuzzers in Zap, okay? There's Dearbuster, there's, uh, other, uh, uh, there's other dictionaries you can import, I'll show you in a second how you can import them. Eventually, I'll you know, just pick a couple of directories. In my case, I typically pick Raft and a couple of similar uh, directories, uh, dictionaries for file discovery, okay? So raft, large, or raft, oh, that's probably a small one, raft, files, lowercase. And then I simply, after picking the right dictionary to replace with the file name, all I have to do is just start fuzzing and then Zap will try all the possibility and let me know what the results were for each possibility, what the response code were, 404 means typically that it, it doesn't exist, what does exist, and so on and so on. I can actually filter according to the request and response to see if anything specific different than 404 were identified or something with a very big size or different size where it was identified. That's one method. Another method is a more dedicated file discovery dedicated method which was built into Zap. It also exists as an external tool. Okay? Originally it was called, it, it still is called Dearbuster, it's another OS project, but it's kind of ingrained in Zap these days. You can simply right click, let's see if I can see it here. You right click, attack, forced browse site or forced browse directory or forced browse directly directory and children. 
What this option will do is to automatically attempt to identify files, directories, and subdirectories, depending on your choice, in the URL or website of your choice. It will automatically try to identify files of various technology, technologies and you know, anything relevant. Now, although it you can be configured, you can configure the various lists it will use, uh, you know, out of the dictionaries that you have, it's not as, uh, well, in my opinion, not as easy to configure uh, as uh, the typical Dear Buster, you know, but it will work just the same, okay? That's another thing you can do. Use the dedicated uh, force bars in future. Finally, there's the matter of gaining if, uh, quality dictionaries. If you want to dis uh, discover secret URLs in a target website, you have to identify uh, you know, relevant names. If you take just you know, bad dictionary, you may uh, try to access irrelevant page names and entry point names. So Zap has a nice, kind of like, plugin store feature, okay? Manage add-ons, that's the feature. I really recommend that all of you will click it right now, it's a great feature. If you'll be using it for developer, development, SSDLC, QA testing or whatever, the extension here, the extensions here can really help you out. It will, it will need the internet connection because it's going to download it from the repository, okay? And you can either update your existing plugins or go to the marketplace and check for existing additional plugins. The reason I have so many dictionaries is because I installed various optional dictionaries of Dearbuster, of FastDB, of you know, SVN Digger, a couple of optional dictionaries which are uh, relatively well, high quality. It depends how we, how we turn it, okay? How, I would refer to it, but they're very good dictionaries and they typically when using on, the, on websites, they cover some nice stuff, okay? So that's one method to identify secret entry points for forced browsing attacks. Simply to brute force the website, perform a dictionary attack in order to uncover, uh, enumerate files uh, and uh, directories. Another method is more, uh, well, it's kind of a detective work, okay? You're already able to use Zap to crawl the application. The nice thing about Zap, it stores everything. Now, this is the most underused feature in the industry. I don't know why. I'm working with a lot of painters, had, had the, the privilege of know, training over 100 painters slash hackers over the years, know, probably a couple of hundred of developers, maybe, maybe even more. Uh, I've been doing training for uh, 1, 11, 12 years, something like that. So I've been teaching Zap and Bear for a long, long time, and nobody ever uses this feature. And it's so key to uncovering secret URLs, and it's so easy. If you go to various web page, each web page in the application, Zap will store the content of all the HTML files, dynamic files, JS files, everything. In order to identify secret entry points, all you have to do is to seek dynamic extensions. That's it, that's it. So let's say right now in a Tech API, I'm a, I access Tech API and it's a JSP application. I would typically search Zap, I'll just delete the rest of the content so I won't be confused by relevant data. I'll just delete some content. I don't know why it's very slow today, but it is. Sorry guys. Now, I'll actually restart Zap because I think doing the demo will work faster. I just put too much information into it. The only disadvantage of uh, of Zap, it has a fantastic tool set. Sometimes if you overload it with too much requests, it gets stuck, okay? Perhaps it doesn't have the same issues. However, if you manage it properly and use it in the right context, it's very useful. Now, uh, what I'll do is something I don't recommend you'll do uh, for your own applications. I'm going to spider the application. The reason I won't recommend you to spider your own applications is because the spider feature actually accesses every possible page. So if you're authenticated, let's say to your bank, 
There's like buttons of deactivate account, transfer one million dollars, whatever. There's various buttons, it will actually click all of them. Had a guy once, a pen tester, the same one I said that is like instructing yesterday, he did it for his Facebook account. He didn't have many friends there. There's like the remove friend button in Facebook. <laughs> didn't work too well for him. Had to restart. Okay? So anyway. Um, so spider is dangerous in case I didn't uh, emphasize that enough. So I'm going to use spider on this very specific website, only in this specific instance, so I can gather some content, okay? I'm going to disable the proxy because I don't want any garbage information in Zap. I want this search to be very focused, okay? So I'll use the attack spider feature very carefully and, I don't know, after a couple of uh, spidering, uh, well, after a couple of URLs that will be uncovered, I think that's enough for me. That's good enough. I'll do, I'll use the search feature in Zap. Now, Zappa has a fantastic search feature. So it searches everywhere, everywhere in the request and the response, okay? I can actually define what I want, request, response, URL, whatever, wherever I want it to be found. So in my case, I want content being disclosed by mistake in JavaScript files, in HTML comments, stuff like that. Things that, that uh, developers forgot, okay? So, I don't know, uh, probably uh, a long time ago, in one of Israel's three major banks, that's, you know, as low as I get, one of the three, you can guess on your own, uh, I had, a, you know, an application of the clerk, the application that the clerks use. Now, it was a web application, I right-clicked on the main page, and then just viewed the source, and there was an HTML comment there that says, the page runsql.asp is obsolete and should be removed. Okay? Something like that. Okay? It's saying you just, you know, just don't do much. Just copy and paste the URL. And you get to the runsql page. And there, there, was, there was no design whatsoever. There was a text box and submit. But, you know, select, you know, everything from sys objects presented the entire content of the SQL database. And then select it. You, you got the point. Okay? So, the developers disclose, you know, really ridiculous amounts of content unintentionally. They disclose it in JavaScript files, they disclose it unintentionally in content. This is the best way to identify secret entity points, even in your application, okay? I've been using it for years, people don't understand how, how I find you know, vulnerabilities on top of other people, because there's simply entry points that other people don't identify. Yes? Yes, well, we used to have a methodology called log hacking. I don't remember what we did with it eventually. Over the years, it got twisted. We didn't really publish it, in which we created all the search criteria to search in proxy logs. So we had dot extensions for specific technologies, such as dot JSP, dot do, dot PHP, dot JS, dot HTML. And we would filter all those results. Then eventually got to comments and technologies. There's a bunch of those, okay? Now, Zap has passive plugins, but the passive plugins can't uncover everything, okay? They can't do all the work for you, for you. And though this specific task, uncovering secret entry points, it's a manual job, okay? It's a, it's a manual because sometimes the conventions of the URL are more complicated. You need to search for fragments. So for, for our, in our example, just searching for .jsp in the response, we'll get a bunch of matches, okay? A bunch of matches, and we can go through them and identify different web pages in the application. Now, sometimes we will have the same page, it might be tedious, but in many, many, many scenarios, we'll identify pages we would never have identified in other ways. I mean, we would, we would see administrator pages, you would see old pages, obsolete pages, we'll get a bunch of those, okay? So that's another method to identify those pages, very effective for the purposes of forced browsing, okay? Now, in your exercise, later on, not now, you can use all methods. You can use guess on your own, search manually, use 
the fast testing feature, use the built-in DearBuster engine within Zap, the force browsing feature. You can do whatever you want, or my recommendation, start with the search feature with the extension of the technology the website is developed in. If it's a PHP website, it has PHP extension, search for .php. And search for .php is the response, and see what is disclosed. <coughs> if you are testing AMO, an ASP.NET website, search for .aspx, and so on and so on. Search for URLs and data points, you'll see what you get, okay? If you are, you know, those of you working inside, you know, some sort of bin conglomerate, that's a good opportunity to check your website and see what you're really exposing unintentionally to the user in your various libraries. Now, the extension to that, the extension to force browsing, the other uses you can do with force browsing is directly access files that contain sensitive content regardless of whether or not they're, di they're dynamic, okay? We typically, you know, we, the short term for it is uh, backup files and OST uh, coins it as old backup and all reference files. That, uh, that's the category in OST, okay? It's generally any file that we can directly access within force browsing in the website, which is old, obsolete, unintentional, or compressed, which is fantastic way to start a hacking day job, okay? Another story. Remember that back I told, I told you earlier? Not him, one of his competitors. <laughs> one of the big three, okay? They had a website to register online for various banking purposes, you know, to just start an account. Now the website was a JSP website, okay? Well, I'm searching for a specific place. You should smile and look ashamed right now, but you know. Uh, He's not here right now. Uh, anyway, so uh, the website was written in JSP, and the website directory name, there was a specific directory name. I don't remember what it was. It was a, you know, enlist or join or whatever. The developer there wanted to create a backup copy of the directory, so he zipped it, okay? So if you would have written join.zip at the root URL of the bank, the entire source code of the website, the source code, database, queries, database passwords, tru truly amazing information, hard-coded passwords of secret accounts, stuff like that, okay? Would have been downloaded to your PC, okay? Same, I, I saw similar instances in you know, numerous other websites, old backup files, uh, zip file, compressed websites. And in the past, I had to do the entire job manually. These days, you know, Zap has built-in features. And what can we identify? How does it look like? How, how does an old fi uh, backup uh, compressed file look like? Now, well, it depends. A, there's uh, backup files and source code files that we can access, but we typically aren't able to download them directly. There's a reason for that. Dynamic website technologies differ from, uh, you know, dynamic files differ from static files in a very specific aspect. When I'm accessing an HTML file or a JavaScript file, you know, in, in technologies other than Node.js, the file isn't executed in the, web, in the website. It's actually being downloaded to the browser as is, and the, the browser is, you know, passing it, presenting it, and that's it. It's only being executed in the client side. It's being downloaded from the website. And the dynamic page is actually being executed when we access it in the server side, and the output of that page is what we see in the browser. We don't download the file. The server doesn't let us. It only returns the output of the execution of that dynamic page. That's how it works, okay? Now, uh, so accessing protected configuration files, like WebXML in Java, WebConfig in .NET, SPX, the various SPX extensions in .NET, JSP or the various extensions in Java, in properly configured web servers, you're not supposed to be able to download them. However, the backup extensions of them, you know, that's a completely different thing. Accessing .jsp.back, I mean, that's not an executable extension. 
the file will be downloaded immediately, okay? Dot, the old dot grandma dot grandpapa, I don't know, you, you pick the extension, there's a bunch of those, okay? Accessing the obsolete exchange is a fantastic way to download the actual code of something very close to it without actually, uh, you know, while skipping the whole ex server-side execution uh, uh, phase, okay? So we can either access compressed elements of files, okay, zip, the tar, tar, rar, jet, jar, there's a bunch of tools that do that automatically. Verbsuit Pro has a very good engine, Zap has as well, okay? just to uncover backup files. There's a, you know, hardcore backup extensions, adding one at the end, old, back, backup, BCK, and so on, so on. And there's something which is, you know, it's very rare to see these days, uh, simply because technology isn't being used as, as much as it used to be, as much as it was used in the past. Lucky me, stop talking. Okay, so there's something called includes. And obsolete or relatively obsolete technologies like JSP, it's still being used, and you know, PHP have built in features to include source code from a centralized you know, file. So a couple of files in the website can actually reduce the amount of code that the developer needs to write by including another file. Those of you who are CC++ developers, it's very much like the include instruction CC++, okay? It differs from import in Java because we're not importing something uh, well, we're importing something that may reside on the web server. That's the whole point. Now, include files are source code files with an extension that does not compile. Okay? So, accessing an include file directory, directly, if we figure out what it is, okay, will actually cause the web server to refer to it not as dynamic code, but as code which is static. So, we'll get it back if we access it directly. All of those files, temp files, backup files, archives, just by either guessing them or enumerating them, or you know, somehow uh, accessing them directly, will be able to uh, you know, get their sensitive content. Now, before uh, you figure out you know, how do we get to those pages at all, how do we figure out which obsolete pages may exist in the application, there's a very nice way I want to show you. It's amazing in terms of what it can get you in penetration test. Um, I can't emphasize it enough, and it's very effective specifically for obsolete content. It's called Wayback Machine. Anyone hear about it? I mean, except for the pen testers? Very few people, really? Wayback Machine, the Wayback Machine. Okay, so Wayback Machine is a fantastic tool. You know, it's not designed for pen testing, but it's very useful for uh, penetration testing purposes. It's actually an archive of the internet at different periods, okay? It's an online resource, freely usable, you can access it anyway. And let's say you want to see a version of a website 10 years in the past, including all the page names that existed 10 years in the past, it's there. Now, give me a website. Don't, uh, not security agencies, right? Something I won't be assassinated for. Come on, man. Something universal. CNN.com, okay? CNN.com. Okay, so let's go to CNN.com and see, uh, I think it's HTTPS these days, but you know, let's see what CNN.com means us. I think I need a complete one, but you know, we'll see. has the addition subdomain these days. Just a sec. What you can see is that there's history for this subdomain, editioncnn.com, since 2001. You can actually see the changes in cnn.com throughout the entire history of the website. Not just that, you can actually access a specific instance in history and access all the pages that were documented in that specific year in cnn.com. 
all the names of the entry points, all the names of, well, the content, okay, really, that you have. So let's say the current menu of the website presents five pages, but I'm going to Wayback History two years ago, and I see 25. Those pages are likely still there. In many cases, developers know there's the mentality, if it works, don't touch, right? So those pages are likely there. You might be able to access them. So I did that like a couple of weeks ago. I had a pen test against a, I think it was a car service uh, application. I, won't, I can't give its name, but I can describe the service. So I went way back and I went to other pages that they had in the past and they had a page called Encrypt, okay? Which was, you know, it was an old page, .aspx page, something like that. Now, that application, you know, that page it was actually responsible for, you know, a gazillion features that they had, okay? So, they, you, you was able to uh, actually decipher, decipher the SSO token of the application. You were able to encrypt and decrypt and create your own authentication tokens for an admin user, for any type of, but it, you know, it, it, they intended to delete it, they wanted to delete it, they just forgot about it. It worked, they didn't want to mess around with the pages in the application, so they just kept it there for years. And using Wayback and comparing the URLs that I see there, the URLs that I see, after calling the application or to you know, a, a commercial a interception proxy, I would be able to identify the gaps and access the obsolete pages. So that's another method to do, uh, to identify obsolete pages. Well, well, the first method is obviously fast testing and using a, a Dearbuster and other, a, a, you know, those of you who use Bell Pro, the discover content feature is fantastic, okay? It's really good at identifying uh, exactly those kind of cave pages. But if you, you know, if you want to do like a, a more thorough job, way back machine. Um, let's see. I think you guys just earned your break. Let's see if I missed anything. Yeah, well, well, I want to give you a couple of notes about uh, the dangers of using Zap's automated features. Yes. Yes. Of course it's in scope. You're, you're right. It's, I'm just, you know, Avi talked to me about doing a sec dev course and uh, then we kind of melt on and figure out that people won't come to sec dev course, which is pretty much commodity these days. So we kind of migrated it to half sec dev and half uh, hacking and eventually went to majorly hacking and then a little bit sec dev, which is what we have today. We're getting all the sec dev material for the final phases. We're actually giving you like a perfect page examples. All the steps you need to perform from the beginning of a web module to the end of a web module or any module, okay? To mitigate most of the uh, commonly used attack these days. As an answer to a question in terms of false browsing, the specific mitigation is authentication validation. You need to validate an authentication Sesh, uh, value in the session, authentication token, whatever your authentication method is, and permission validation. Yeah, a, a tempering attack, the mitigation is to reduce the consumer control, okay? There's two methods, really. .NET has a fantastic feature of signing uh, web controls, okay? Maybe you've heard about it, event validation and view state, stuff like that. Now those fields actually enable you to enforce to specific fields like text boxes, combo boxes, or combo boxes and list boxes, to make sure that the user won't be able to send values not originally in its list. I won't discuss the how of it, it's a bit com more, more complicated, but the server verifies a signature that if the client changed anything, the server will be able to see that that is not a value, he had an option to choose. A better solution, a much better solution is to avoid allowing the client to send the value from the client side entirely. There's no reason in the world for the client to deliver the price to you. Does that make sense? I mean, unless you're um, a very, very generous dealer, okay? There's no reason for the client to send an is admin flag to you or is discount equals zero to you. I mean, you shouldn't get those flags and parameters from the client. Those, this is just bad practice. Now, although it's bad practice, and it is 2017, 
trust me, I see it all the time. <laughs> All the time, and I don't know entities in the cloud, cloud some of the uh, some of the entities in the cloud. We've been we've been working together for years, and and, and they see the findings over the years. It it happens because the developer has no awareness that those values he has written his in his you know perfect code from his perspective can actually be abused, not to the client good. The client good is protected, right? How would somebody manipulate it, especially in mobile applications? or thick client applications. It's just, you know, it's un incomprehensible because they've never seen an interception proxy and how it works, okay? But it's there. But in a solution, reduce consumer control. Don't accept content from the client that you can accept from elsewhere. Only receive parameters that are, you know, only the client can send them and you have no choice but to get them from the client and so on and so on. That's the best practice. So, did I answer your question? False browsing and authentication validation, authorization validation, reduce consumer control. Uh, okay. Um, coffee break? Yes. Coffee break? Now, because I know you guys will be late. I was the one late last time, but you know, anyway. Because I know you guys will be late. I'm going to take a short break until uh, 4 p.m. That's a lot of time for coffee, alcohol, you know, seven Red Bulls because I see the faces falling asleep here. No, there's a Red Bull machine here. I really recommend. Good stuff. Very healthy food.